Hi, my name's uh, Mike Cohen, and I'm going to be talking about the uh, Oakland County child killer, um, who it was a series of four murders uh, taking place between February of 1976 till March of 1977. Um, today, I'm going to discuss uh, victim one, Mark Stebbins, and victim two, Jill Robinson. So I'm going to talk a little bit. So Mark Stebbins, so it's February 15th, 1976. Um, this is the last time uh, people will see Mark alive. Uh, he's at the uh, American Legion Hall in Ferndale, Michigan. Um, the, the story is he was uh, at the American Legion. Uh, there was like this party there. His mother worked there. Uh, he didn't really, you know, he didn't really want to be there. There was like some kind of movie going on he wanted to watch. And back then, you know, if you didn't watch the movie on TV, who knows when you were going to see it again. Uh, he was really into the military, you know, like army stuff, wanted to join the Marines. And um, so he asks his mom if uh, he can go home because it's not a crazy walk. It's it's not far. If he can go home and uh, watch the movie and his mom says, sure, why not? So uh, Mark heads home. And um, at some point, I believe his mom calls, um, but but nobody picks up. But, you know, back then there weren't cell phones or answering machines or caller ID. So, you know, not too much thought of it. Maybe he's doing something else. He's really into the movie or something. Uh, around 9 that night, she calls again. His older brother, Michael, answers and asks, hey, is uh, Mark home? And um, he says no. So now she's she's getting a little worried. So she heads home. And um, she calls police. Now, here's the thing with this one. Uh, it, it's kind of like, it's sad, but at the same time, slightly like, I don't know if they're trying to keep her at ease. or So he's like the first victim of this. So she calls the police, and they don't take it really too seriously. Uh, one of the officers, I guess, said, you know, oh, hey, we haven't had a kidnapping in 10 years. You know, kind of try to, like, put her mind at ease. And so, you know, they go through the night, and, um, you know, Mark doesn't come home the next day. So, you know, she goes down there and she's like, hey, you know, he's not any of his friend's house. You know, he didn't come back. So so now this draws a concern and the police are like, all right, let's 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 start looking for him. So so they start looking for him. There's no real indication of Mark anywhere. Um, you know, nobody nobody sees anything, you know, and then like the 17th rolls by and, and the 18th. Uh, but apparently there is a very odd phone call uh, from a guy, uh, Arch Sloan, which we'll, we'll hear about him quite a bit. That um, he called, and this guy is a convicted pedophile out on parole, working as like a tow truck driver or whatever, working at some service stations. And apparently that night that he um, goes missing, um, there's a call that he's like, oh, hey, listen, um, the light's going to be on at my shop. Uh, no reason for concern. I'm just working here by myself. Um, you know, nothing to, to worry about. No need to stop by, you know, and you know, this is the first victim, you know, they don't at this point, you know, when she, I don't even need to call and, and, and they're not, they're not thinking, okay, anything bad has happened. Maybe he's at a friend's house or something. So, you know, this phone call gets completely disregarded, but he is questioned at some point. So anyway, we get to, um, February, uh, 19th and Mark's body is found between, um, 11 and 11.30, uh, dumped in plain view near an office building, um, and there's some things on his um, body that are found later on that could have been important but kind of were overlooked. Um, so he he's found that morning by a guy who, who didn't even know he thought he was like a mannequin or something, but enough alarm to go in and tell the police. So when they when the police come back out, they, they determine that it's Mark Stebbins, um, and there's some things with his um, that that we'll, I'll talk about real quick. Like, I'm not going to go in as detail, like these podcasts um, that I'll mention real quick by uh, J. Ruben Appleman, You Know They Know, uh, the Hulu documentary, uh, Children of the Snow, um, his book, The Killing Jar, and um, Nina... Uh, in her, um, I'm going to mispronounce her name, Nina Instead. Uh, she has one called Don't Talk to Strangers. This is going to go into more detail of like what, what happened. So, you know, check those out and check out the books. Um, so they find Mark, you know, between 11, 1130. Um, and apparently like there's a blanket on him and he's in the same clothes that he was last seen in. And now we're going to just go to that crime scene for a second. But uh, apparently I heard 
in um, Nina's uh, podcast that someone said there was a blue Le Mans, Le Mans or, 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 or Vega near that dumpster. And, and that's kind of like key because you'll hear a lot about that car. And um, so it was parked near there. Uh, there was a guy who walked his dog earlier and said that that was around 930 and the body wasn't there because his dog would have noticed it. So, you know, Mark was dumped really probably any time between after that till 11, so within an hour, and there was this car here, but nobody really thought of it. So, you know, they, they go through the uh, autopsy report and, you know, things that weren't released to the public, but, um, you know, Mark was, was held. He was, um, you know, they had this thing where they said that, like, he was taken care of and his clothes were all washed and everything. No, he was wearing the same clothes. Uh, they weren't washed. Um, he was found in uh, Southfield, Michigan um, area. So, you know, so he was picked up in, in Ferndale, found in, 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 in Southfield. So, you know, and then there's things like, you know, so there was this blanket that later comes into play, but they're doing the autopsy report. Um, you know, there was signs of sexual abuse. Uh, some, you'll hear in like some things that they, that wasn't released till later or like they didn't really talk about it. Uh, he did have a head injury. Uh, there was blood. He looked like he got hit with something in the back of his head. There was blood on his t-shirt. Uh, his jeans, they said, uh, there wasn't really any dirt on him. It just on the one side, but they said that's because he was like, like put there. So, so they're going through all this and, um, you know, Mark, there's a, a couple weird things too. So, um, um, Mark was, you know, had his funeral and a week after his funeral, there was a prayer card left at the, at the dump scene where his body was found. And, um, you know, his mother, Ruth, uh, even said something like, you know, that was strange. Could I have even shaken hands with the person who killed my son? So there's a lot of like things that get like botched up in, in this. Cause there are things that are found <coughs> such as like hairs later on and they did have suspects but they didn't say anything that arch sloan guy um who who called they were actually questioning him and you know like you know they couldn't find him over this time and they also didn't release that arch was a none of the people that will be mentioned were in the 70s at this point were ever mentioned and not found out until way later um i believe that maybe in in my theory with mark and and in in each one i'm going to talk about where I think they might have been. So uh, Arch Sloan had like, you know, this trailer off in like this abandoned like warehouse area where you wouldn't even know it was there. He's the guy who called. I think maybe he definitely was involved in the Stebbins kidnapping and sexual abuse part. I don't know if he was a part of the killing part. Um, but I think he was, he, he was located in, in his area in that trailer and that's just my personal opinion that's what i think that's where he was held because what i've come to the conclusion i don't think these kids were held in the same spot um and they're all found in different areas from where they're picked up but that's where i think he is so they were looking at arch sloan and you know nothing really came of it and some tips came in and, and people were talking and, and sending in these tips and these two guys names and, and you'll hear them connected quite a bit of uh, Gregory Green and and Chris Bush are mentioned during this as well. So, you know, it, it's kind of just like they 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 put some stuff out into the press, you know. So, you know, they had this kid, but they they really wanted they didn't really talk about the being held captive, like tied up or the sexual abuse at that time because they wanted to, like, you know, maybe try to keep hysteria down or not panic or anything. So, you know. It's kind of like, unfortunately, Mark Stebbins' murder at the time kind of fell on like deaf ears. And like, you know, it was, they thought about it. They still were following up on it, but there just really wasn't anything in going on too much with it. Um, because he was the first victim. So we're not looking at like, oh, what, what's going on? It's just a random abduction with, with a kid that was held for a few days and then murdered. So, you know, it, not much thought of it like you know maybe it might be a one-off uh this is a picture of um mark stebbins he was 12 years old when he was abducted uh and found four days later at that office building um you know and and his brother uh michael stebbins is you know still he's on documentaries and he talks about it you know he he feels like you know he said that like you know maybe if i was with mark that day and i was walking home with him maybe this wouldn't have happened you know you can't really blame yourself you don't really think something like this is going to happen and like this is like the first series of it this is like the start so a lot of you know you don't think of much of it and you know they haven't seen things like this 
happen around here very often. So it's like, you know, it was mishandled. So like, even with his, his autopsy report, like I said, that blanket, that blanket doesn't even like get, like they talk about it. They don't know who really dropped it or was it the police or whatever. I don't know. But he, like, they don't, it doesn't get looked at until the fourth victim, a few months after the fourth victim, you know, and then there are hairs found on, on Mark, you know, there, there, there are certain things that should have been really looked at. And how about like, you know, they should have looked into deeper with Arch Sloan. They, they should have really like went in to his area to see if they could find any evidence of Mark, because later on you find out that there is a car that has Mark that Arch Sloan owned and there's some tie-ins there. So, you know, they should, but you know, I don't know what they were thinking then, but yeah, they really should have pursued that Arch Sloan thing. And someone should have said, Hey, you know, that guy is a convicted pedophile and he called in that night. That's, that's kind of weird that he didn't want anybody around him. So that's why I've come to the conclusion. I think that Mark was in that trailer the whole time. I think that's what happened. So after everything with that, everything's kind of really quiet you know, and the summer goes by, but a lot of crazy shit goes on in the summer that gets discovered. No, like murders or disappearances, but two guys I mentioned earlier, they're, they're doing a lot of crazy shit this summer, which comes out later in the next year. Um, so, you know, we're going on, on a few months now, and then all of a sudden it's, uh, December, uh, 22nd. Uh, this is, uh, Jill Robinson, uh, Jill Robinson, she was, uh, you know, just had a regular argument with her mom about some household chores and whatnot. And her mother was like, you know, well, well, you know, maybe you should go cool off. So a few hours go by, um, and she, she sends out like one of her sisters and, and they come back in and they go, Hey, you know, uh, Jill's not home, but you know, like Jill packed up a book bag earlier and like stormed off, you know, for like dramatic effect or whatever. So they're like, oh, Jill's not outside. And her mother's like, oh yeah, she is, but she's not. So she figured she was on her way to go see her dad who was a few miles away. Uh, cause they're, they were just freshly divorced or, or divorced not too long, but, and she went to go visit him or whatever was what they thought. So they call it in, uh, Jill's father calls it in when they find out Jill did not go to his house. So now we're, it's December 23rd, um, and they find her, uh, not her car, her bike behind a hobby shop. So now they're like, okay, this is a suspicion. So now, now they're starting to like go out and look for Jill. So Jill was, she was like from Royal Oak and she was, dumped and her dump site's very interesting and it and I'm going to talk about that might not have even been what was supposed to be the original dump site so uh you know Christmas goes by so on December 26th in the early morning Jill Robinson is found um Jill Robinson hers is different from everybody else's um so Jill Robinson is found across from the Troy Michigan police so she was from Royal Oak, she's found in another area of, um, in Michigan, Troy, um, pretty much within eye shot of the police department. She was dumped right across the street. Now, the difference between hers and the other kids are she, um, she was shot in the face. Um, so the killer, you know, dragged her out and shot her in the face. Uh, it's later found that she, Strong possibility, I think it might have even been confirmed, she did die of strangulation the same way that Mark was killed. But they're not putting these connections together. So, like, it happens 10 months after Mark Stebbins. Mark Stebbins is a boy. Jill is a girl. Mark Stebbins is found just, you know, suffocated with, like, you know, being held captive ropes with sexual abuse, uh, according to things. And it can be iffy because there's this doctor who's on these cases who's... I, he's just found to be just a complete moron and he botches up so many autopsies. So some of these reports and evidence gets like mislabeled, mishandled, and it's just a complete mess. So they, they, they find Jill, uh, we're going to go with, there was no sexual abuse. Um, she was shot in the face and she was found like on the side. Now, during that night, there was a guy who said he saw a Lamaze, which is around that that time, which is, which is a Pontiac car, I believe. I'm not, I'm not a car buff, but it's a Pontiac Lamaze. And he said he saw it pulled over on the side of the road. And when he got closer, it kind of sped off. So that means Jill's original dump site was supposed to be probably not in front of the police department. 
Um, and then that guy, even investigators find out he can give like more of a description. So there was body damage on the driver's side, you know, the, the light was out and he even gave a partial plate. And I stress that a lot when I talk about the next one, because there's just things that we should be piecing together, but I don't know what was going on. The seventies, you know, this is crazy. It's all in the suburbs, but they should have been trained to pinpoint on things like this, but I don't know. It was, it was 40 plus years ago. So the, he says he sees this, he's got a partial license plate. So they're trying to talk about that during that time. And also there's a, um, uh, a thing that one of the officers says, who's, who's actually, you know, really tries to stay on this and, and keeps things to the facts that when the guy went to drop Jill, she had her backpack on. And sometimes after being suffocated in, in a short time, because she was killed probably right before she was dumped, when she was dropped, there was like an exhale of breath of some oxygen that might have still been in there. So she lets that go. The killer panics and he shoots her um, in the face. So um, that that was the theory on that. But again, like, so there was like no sexual abuse. And with Jill, there's it the, the was kind of just like, you know, Mark, it wasn't like, it's just like, okay, these aren't connected. One's a boy, one's a girl. One had sexual abuse, one didn't have sexual abuse. One was suffocated at the time. They thought, you know, well, they knew Mark was. Uh, one was shot in the face. What are we dealing with here? They don't have these two connected. Uh, connected. Uh, Jill was 12 years old. Uh, this is a photo of Jill and also the photo they were using to look for her. So, you know, but like during this, like they didn't go as hard as you'll see when I talk about the next victim later on in another episode. And I'm going to be a, a more extensive on her because she was kind of the reason why I really took an interest in this case because I felt like there was just like so much with hers. So we have, back to, to Mark and Jill. So we have Mark who was held for about four days. We have Jill who was held for about four days, uh, abducted, one with sexual abuse, one with not. But, you know, Jill probably didn't get good treatment while she was with them. I mean, sometimes you hear like in, in some of the reports, you know, their clothes were cleaned. They looked like they were well fed, well taken care of. Later to find out that is not really the case with these kids. So, you know, so here's that blue Lamaze again that I'm talking about with, um, that they, that someone mentioned was at the, um, Mark Stebbins dumping site right before. Um, and why that guy was also probably carrying a shotgun. There's theories like, well, what if he got pulled over or someone came near him? You know, we got to get rid of witnesses and whatnot. The other thing is, is I heard that like one of his brake lights are out, like, but it was Christmas night into the next day. So, you know, people are with their families, you know, cops probably aren't on super high alert. It was just the timing of when that was dropped as to why they were able to get away with it a little bit easier. I think if it was a different day, maybe scenarios would have been different. So here's at the point in the case where we have two kids abducted, held for days, and killed. So, you know, that no real pattern is being made at this time, but we find out a lot of things later on that wasn't released during the time of this investigation to families or the public that will be released and found out over 30 years later. And again, like I, I, I understand why, but Mark and, and uh, Jill's case were not handled the same way as victim three and four were handled. And and it's not just like, because I also call victim three and victim four high profile kids, you know, um, you know, uh, Mark's mom was just like single mom working at the American Legion, you know, not really well, well known or, or connected, you know, Jill, Jill's mom, I don't really know much about, but her dad, uh, to my understanding, was a teacher. So it's just like, you know, this is just average families and stuff. But it's interesting and something that I put together that um, I feel like. They were, if I don't know if they did it on purpose or something, but the next two victims in this case are higher profile children. And with Jill, I've kind of come to the conclusion, like I said, with Mark, I feel like he was at that trailer that Arch Sloan owned, because I don't think these kids were kept all in the same place. That's just something I came to after listening to podcasts, reading and stuff, and, and hearing about certain people being connected to certain things. Um, so... Uh, I think that that's where Mark was. I think Jill, honestly, was at 
Greg Green's house. And later on when we talk about him, it's found through his brother years later that he had a hidden room in his house that he said he used to hold people captive so he could sexually abuse boys. Now, and I emphasize on boys because, like, you know, the the guys and the suspects you'll hear about later, they all talk about sexual encounters with boys. So my question is, is like, so why were girls abducted? So I don't know, like, because it doesn't seem like they were talking about how this guy was a genius. These guys were not geniuses. The system and the people they had on the case, not not so much the officers, more that doctor and just just a lot of mistakes not being taken to the highest alert of things. You know, it, they just got lucky with a lot of sloppiness during the autopsies and the evidence being taken care of. These guys were no geniuses. In fact, they were probably, they just got lucky. Because honestly, when I really dug into them, I've come to the conclusion that they were really not that bright. Um, one of the indicators is you're you're going to drive around with a car with a tail light out. That's a that's a way to get um, police um, to pull you over. Another guy, the kid goes missing. You're a convicted pedophile on parole, and you're calling the cops saying, "Hey, you know, don't stop by here. Uh, it's just me." You know, and like I said, I'm going to talk about my theories and my feelings on all of this. And that I also think that this case should be solved and things should be pressed on more. So now we're up to two kids in 1976 from February was the first one. Now the end of the year in December. And like I said, there was a big gap and there were things going on in the summer with the, with some of the suspects that is later found out. Um, so we'll go into that. So the next uh, episode... I'm going to be talking about victim number three, uh, Christine Mihalik, and I've done a lot of reading and listening on hers, and her case is, is slightly different as well, due to the fact that she was the youngest victim, and she was also held the longest, where, where you look at Mark and Jill were held for about four days, Christine was held for almost three weeks, and there's also two locations mentioned with hers that that come into play later of sightings and whatnot. So, you know, I, I hope you stick with me. Uh, my next episode will be on victim three, Christine Mihalik, and also what, uh, what I think and why she was kept for so long.